Welcome. My name is uh, Michael Mann, and I'm a thoracic surgeon at uh, the University of California here in San Francisco. I'm also director of our cardiothoracic translational research laboratory. And I have the privilege of talking to you today about our work in developing a better approach for molecular prognosis that can be implemented today in the management of our early stage non-small cell lung cancer patients, and in particular, those with a non-squamous histology. I'd like to just mention at the outset that I am a consultant for Life Technologies Corporation, and they are the entity that has taken over the molecular assay uh, that we're gonna talk uh, about most of uh, today's uh, discussion. That assay is now available uh, commercially for any patient uh, really around the world. Uh, it's known as the Prevenio Lung RS test. And as you'll see through the course of today's lecture, uh, I'm hoping to convince you that it uh, may be a very important uh, and meaningful component in the better management of patients with early stage uh, non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer. Now, hopefully, uh, many of you are familiar with developments in the use of molecular prognostics uh, for cancer that have really evolved dramatically over the past decade. And our colleagues in the field of breast cancer really deserve uh, an enormous amount of credit for pioneering that work and making the use of molecular prognosis uh, a very well-established part of the standard of care for early stage breast cancer. So hopefully I don't need to convince you of the relevance and the clinical validity of the use of molecular prognosis to augment and to enhance conventional prognostic indicators, such as those that feed into the standard TNM staging system. But what I do hope to convince you of is that a very well-validated tool is now available for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer patients. And not only is that tool available to provide better prognostic information, but that, that tool can be implemented today even given the remainder of the, of the base of uh, literature and clinical knowledge that we have to lead to more informed management of patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer in our clinics today. Now, I've listed some objectives for this, uh, for this next hour. Uh, we'll talk about the need initially for better prognostic information in managing these patients. As I mentioned, we'll talk about the immediate clinical utility of this improved information, and then uh, run through uh, the, valid, the development and the validation of a multi-gene test that is now available, as I mentioned, uh, for patients and their doctors around the world. What is the problem that we're addressing? Well, we just had a brand new staging system introduced uh, only a few years ago to guide the management of non-small cell lung cancer. It's a seventh edition of the AJCC TNM staging system. And it involves you know, thousands of patients from databases uh, from around the world. <clears throat> One thing I'd like to point out, the number 100,000 cases uh, is often mentioned when people think about this new staging system because that was the total number of patient uh, uh, cases available uh, for development of this new staging system. But we only had available uh, roughly 16,000 patients for uh, derivation and validation of this new staging system because we only had complete data about that number of patients. When it boils down to it, uh, only about uh, 2,000 of those patients were uh, stage one patients uh, used in the actual validation of this new system. And I'll remind you about that number uh, when we talk a little bit later about the validation of the molecular prognostic that's uh, now available and, and in the medical literature. But when we think about TNM staging, of course, it is really nothing more than a prognostic system also based on retrospective uh, data analysis. And unfortunately, in non-small cell lung cancer, 
we don't really get a very crisp and very well differentiated picture of our earliest stage patients. And that's highlighted by the disappointing figure that as many as 30% in stage 1A and 45% uh, roughly in stage 1B uh, are patients who are going to die within five years of their operation, which was intended to be curative. When you compare that to stage one data from other very common uh, solid tumors, such as breast cancer or even colon cancer, those numbers uh, really compare uh, very starkly and in a very disappointing way to the greater than 90% survival that uh, we're able to achieve with those other uh, cancers. And so really, there is a bit of a failure relying entirely on traditional clinical pathologic information, such as that in the TNM system, to truly discriminate between patients who have been cured by surgery, who certainly should have a greater than 90% five-year survival, and those patients who haven't been cured by surgery. Well, what does it mean that they haven't been cured by surgery? As we'll go, as we'll emphasize uh, in a little bit, that means that if they're going to fail within five years with distant disease, there must be undetected metastatic disease even present at the time of their uh, initial operation. Another thing to remember about the staging system and trying to manage patients uh, in stages one and two who are almost uh, always candidates for uh, potentially curative resection is that the number of patients with early stage lung cancer is going to continue to grow as movements towards screening and just the more wider implementation of uh, imaging modalities becomes uh, even more firmly established. So these patients are going to become a bigger piece of the pie and an increasingly important challenge in terms of improving what is now not really acceptable survival for such early stage disease. Okay, backing up, uh, why do so many early stage lung cancer patients end up dying within five years of operation? Of course, these tend to be older patients. The average age of diagnosis in non-small cell lung cancer is still uh, somewhere between 65 and 70. And they're patients, they're patients who have a high uh, degree of smoking histories and other comorbidities. So certainly there are other things that threaten the longevity of these patients. But when you think about early stage patients in stages one and stage two who've undergone attempt to curative operation, the vast, vast majority, and it may be 90% of these patients, eventually succumb to recurrent disease. And that recurrent disease almost always involves distant metastasis. So as we said a few minutes ago, these stage one and stage two patients, although presumably to the best of our uh, ability to analyze traditional clinical pathologic information and traditional imaging modalities only have local or regional disease if they recur distantly within five years, that means they must be harboring undetected metastatic disease, perhaps micrometastatic disease, at the time of their operation. Well, so what? Let's say we were able to better differentiate these early stage patients and know with greater certainty which subgroup among those patients is at the highest risk for harboring micrometastatic disease. What could we do with that information? Well, there's a large percentage of our patients that fall into that category. If we consider operative patients in stage two, it's actually the majority of patients who are likely to, to succumb to rec distant recurrent disease uh, within five years of operation. But there is something that we can do. We know that the adjuvant treatment of non-small cell lung cancer with chemotherapy early after surgery actually improves five-year survival. It improves long-term survival. That improvement in survival is not the same improvement that we see with the treatment of late-stage disease, even with the same chemotherapy agents. Because in late-stage disease, we're very satisfied if we get a few months, or certainly if we get a year or two of additional survival after the patient's diagnosis. But when we treat these patients early after surgery who have only undetectable or micrometastatic disease, we're hoping to get long-term survival. If not absolute cure, we're looking at least for something closer to an increase in five-year survival, which means that there's a qualitative difference 
in treating early stage, perhaps micrometastatic lung cancer, even though it's spread beyond the original tumor and even beyond regional lymph nodes, there's a qualitative difference between treating those patients with systemic chemotherapy and treating patients in late stage disease when they have macroscopic burdens of metastasis because we can achieve long-term cure and, and perhaps just long-term control of a disease that really is not part of the picture when we're dealing with mac macroscopic late stage disease. So there really is quite a bit on the table here. There's a lot at stake and we may actually be saving lives if we can identify more of these early stage patients who are likely to harbor undetectable micrometastatic disease and who could potentially be candidates for, shall we say it, a curative intervention through systemic chemotherapy. All right, well, how does this fit into the actual management of our patients uh, after surgery? Let's think about stages two and stage one separately because right now there's a slightly different approach to their management. So through the existing literature, of which there have been at least three very large scale, scale very well accepted uh, prospective studies that have documented a benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, for these resected uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. Stage two and stage three are the, are the uh, subpopulations of uh, resected patients in whom we've been able to very clearly document a survival benefit with uh, adjuvant intervention. However, even though there are pretty firm recommendations for these stage two patients to receive adjuvant chemotherapy, we all know that compliance with that recommendation is certainly far from 100%. Now, to be sure, uh, these elderly patients uh, do include a subpopulation who just may not be candidates for uh, aggressive chemotherapeutic intervention, particularly the platinum doublets that are really the mainstay of chemotherapy for this disease. But there are also stage two patients who would be acceptable candidates for chemotherapy who forego that intervention now. Now remember, they're dealing with statistics from studies that have not been able to differentiate between the highest risk and the lowest risk patients in stage two. Because remember, even in stage two, we're dealing with uh, maybe 50%, maybe slightly smaller percent of patients who've been cured by surgery alone. So if we treat the entire population with chemotherapy, we're treating an awful lot of patients and we're studying the outcomes for an awful lot of patients for whom that chemotherapy is absolutely of no help, patients who've been cured through surgery alone. <clears throat> but we haven't been able in those studies to, <clears throat> to really carefully differentiate and identify the patients who are at high risk for recurrence, which means they're at high risk for harboring undetected metast metastatic disease. Well, if we were able to ferret out the patients who couldn't possibly benefit from systemic intervention, and then look again at the survival benefit that must be concentrated in the patients who are at high risk for disease, the relatively small survival benefit, and we all remember the numbers from the YALT study, the ANITA study, and um, the JBR10 study, in which the survival benefit was an absolute somewhere between five to 10 to 15 percent, that absolute survival benefit is going to be even greater if we're able to focus only on the patients who are truly likely to harbor metastatic disease. We also know just from analysis of the data from those studies that we have, not surprisingly, tended to see the largest degree of benefit in patients who are in the highest risk. How do we know they were at the highest risk? When we compare stage three patients to stage two patients, we tend to see a, a larger degree of benefit from chemotherapy. Same is true when we compare stage two to stage one. And so realizing that we don't have any biological basis to believe that the micro metastatic or undetected metastatic disease in stages two or even stage one non-small cell lung cancer is biologically inherently different from the undetected disease in stage three or for example, stage two B, it stands to reason that if we can identify the patients who are at high risk in stage one and certainly in stage two, that those patients are likely to derive even more benefit than the current literature would suggest from adjuvant intervention. Now we're talking about a much higher degree of motivation for those high risk patients 
to engage with their oncologists and their doctors uh, to pursue a means of improving what could otherwise be fairly dismal uh, prospects for long-term survival. Now that's stage two, what about stage one? Well, again, we're all familiar with the results of those adjuvant trials in which it's really been difficult, if not impossible, to nail down a documentable survival benefit for stage one patients from adjuvant chemotherapeutic intervention. But even though we don't have hard uh, level one data behind us, the NCCN has actually come out for the past uh, several iterations for a number of years now with a fairly firm recommendation that clinicians need to recognize the very high incidence of undetected metastatic disease among stage one patients and realize that the highest risk patients in that group deserve a chance at intervention that could improve their otherwise very poor prospects for five-year survival. And so there's a level 2B recommendation in the published NCCN guidelines that tells clinicians to look for the high risk patients among stage one and earmark them for chemotherapy. Now how in the absence of any novel technology for differentiating uh, stages uh, within the, the uh, clinical pathologic TNM system, how did the NCCN recommend to clinicians that they go ahead and identify these high-risk patients? Well, they say first look in stage 1B because by definition, stage 1B is higher risk than stage 1A. And then among those high-risk patients, use available anatomic and histologic criteria to guess essentially which of those patients are going to be uh, at highest risk. Now, those criteria, you know, are again derived from past literature and uh, so it's quite reasonable in the absence of any better data for those to be uh, used to help guide important clinical uh, strategic therapeutic decisions. But there's never been any large scale uh, validation, certainly that those criteria identify patients who benefit from chemotherapy. And to be honest, there really isn't great uh, validation out there that those criteria do the best job at identifying stage, even stage 1B patients at the highest risk. Still, we have this NCCN recommendation on the books, and it has to be taken in context that the default level of evidence for NCCN guidelines for this disease is level 2A. So we don't have level 1 prospective randomized evidence uh, for a large number of the recommendations and decisions that are made in managing these patients. But we're recognizing that we need to move forward with our patients, making important, potentially life and death decisions with these patients, using the best available information and synthesizing that information into the most logical, most appropriate approach for each individual patient. So as we've sort of uh, been building the case uh, in the past uh, 10 to 15 minutes, if we had even more accurate prognostic information, we could even better identify patients even in stage one and certainly in stage two who are very likely to harbor undetected metastatic disease after surgery who could potentially derive a life-saving benefit from adjuvant intervention. All right, if there is a need for better prognostic information and the world of breast cancer has already taught us that molecular prognostics could be a very reliable means to get at that information beyond TNM staging. How has the lung cancer research community responded to this challenge? Well, our group was certainly not the first, uh, certainly not the only group to recognize the need for this better prognostic information in the management of early stage lung cancer. There have been at least 15, if not more, very uh, well-run scientific studies, all aimed at the development of a system for better uh, molecular-based prognosis. All of the studies, though, that had been published uh, prior to our most recent work worked with frozen tissue that was dropped in liquid nitrogen in the operating room to best preserve the messenger RNA and therefore get the best possible signal about gene expression patterns in that tissue into the researcher's hand. But we all know that that's not a very practical approach toward the community management of our patients with non-small cell lung cancer. It's really limiting the research to a very pristine level of information and tissue that's not gonna translate into widespread clinical application.
Furthermore, many of these studies, because they had such high quality uh, RNA, uh, relied on a microarray approach to analyzing gene expression patterns. That's also very difficult to uh, turn into a very reliable reproducible regimen in, in the application in the real clinical world and limits the potential applicability of that research uh, as you move to a wide, wide scale basis. The end result has been that although we've had small to medium scale studies from a large number of groups certainly proving the principle that molecular prognosis is achievable in non-small cell lung cancer, none of those uh, small to medium scale studies have achieved a truly blinded large scale validation. And the one study that did attempt a uh, blinded validation really failed to yield a very convincing uh, validation, particularly among stage one patients who are such an important target. And so experts in the field uh, have sort of extracted from this uh, body of data that we really need a practical and reproducible assay with large scale independent validation. Uh, and that was a challenge uh, that we undertook at UCSF in uh, pursuing this type of program. So we realized that we needed to start with a very large uh, cohort of patients to train our assay, to develop our assay. And we decided that we would start with RNA derived only from paraffin tissues for this project, because we know that it's only RNA from paraffin tissues that's gonna be widely available in the community in the foreseeable future. Now, based on research that we also had undertaken in fresh frozen tissue that gave us a clue, boiling down from hundreds of candidate genes, a set of about a dozen genes that were likely to tell an important story about non-small cell lung cancer, we developed a quantitative PCR approach for, again, about a dozen active cancer genes and uh, several what we call housekeeping or control genes so that we could very reliably using a very standard state-of-the-art PCR technology measure gene expression uh, from patients tumors from pathology labs around the country and literally around the world. We used um, various means of uh, trying to really boil down our uh, molecular prognostic formula uh, so that it would not reflect idiosyncrasies of our training or teaching cohort, but that it was more likely to reflect the fundamental molecular biology of this disease. And then we realized that the proof of the pudding was definitely going to be in the eating in terms of getting clinicians to be able to rely on these data to make clinical judgments about their individual patients. And so we realized the most important part of our program was the truly independent and blinded clinical validation that needed to be undertaken once we had our best possible assay with an algorithm that had gone through very tight statistical ringers. And so we turned to colleagues in the clinical research world who could help us not only here in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we were able to engage the help of the Kaiser Northern California Research Institute and cull uh, through them patients from uh, all over Northern California community hospitals managed in their system. But we also looked to the West, to the Far East, if you will, where we had been uh, working with colleagues, leading clinical uh, experts in leading centers in mainland China, with whom we've uh, been able to build a brand new uh, clinical research organization called the China Clinical Trials Consortium that involved the collaboration between uh, established Western leaders in uh, clinical cancer research and leaders in the uh, delivery of outstanding state-of-the-art clinical care in leading centers in China and build uh, more of a workhorse that could get large-scale uh, clinical validation and other clinical trials done in a much shorter period of time uh, than could be uh, achieved under standard uh, conditions here in the West. Now, just to quickly run through uh, the technology that's reflected in the process of this molecular assay, we start with absolutely normal uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded uh, samples. Uh, we extract RNA from this uh, paraffin, recognizing that the RNA is highly fragmented, suffering from heat and uh, RNA degradation, 
but the RNA fragments are of a high enough quality, and this has been proven now uh, again over the past uh, decade or so, that this low quality RNA is still good enough for us to derive very reliable uh, gene expression information if we have a quantitative uh, RT-PCR system that is designed specifically for these types of fragmented uh, RNA uh, samples and is very rigorously tested. Once we measure uh, gene expression patterns, we've then developed an algorithm, again, using very stringent uh, statistical criteria so that we get a risk score in the end that can differentiate between patients that are low risk, high risk, and we have an intermediate group of patients uh, in this assay uh, that are sitting in between the highest uh, and lowest risk patients. Well, as I mentioned, we decided uh, to undertake two parallel uh, validation studies uh, that included uh, roughly 450 patients from Northern California and roughly 1,000 patients from the China Clinical Trials Consortium. When those two independent studies were done, uh, the editors at The Lancet uh, asked us to present uh, the results of those landmark studies in a single publication uh, that appeared in press uh, in March of 2012. And there was really a very large cadre of international uh, uh, cancer research leaders that participated in that effort. And it really uh, has yielded one of the largest um, clinical validations of a molecular prognostic for uh, cancer of any sort. And uh, just to give you a little bit uh, more of a background about uh, whom uh, we're dealing with and, and whose data uh, you're reading about when you hear about the China Clinical Trials Consortium, the core group uh, were leaders from uh, the major metropolitan centers, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and Guangzhou on the eastern seaboard of China. Uh, since uh, the early founding of the organization, we've been able uh, to bring in leaders from other major metropolitan centers from around China. And uh, more recently, we've begun to branch out into other uh, uh, cancer types as well. And you can see there are now vast resources available uh, to augment uh, the clinical research uh, that the same Western leaders who are involved in the Clinical Trials Consortium in China are able to achieve uh, in Western patient populations. So what, what are the actual validation data? Well, when we got the uh, independent analyses back from these two studies, uh, we were impressed by the similarity between the separation of uh, patient uh, outcome data uh, between high, intermediate, and low-risk patients that we achieved in these uh, vastly different uh, patient populations, again, Northern California and uh, the China Clinical Trials Consortium. I might point out at this point that the China Consortium recruited uh, patients from stages 1 through 3A, in other words, all comers uh, for early-stage uh, non-small cell lung cancer resection, uh, and you can see uh, the separation that's achieved uh, among uh, the entire population uh, on the left side of the screen there uh, in the China Consortium. The Kaiser study really focused on stage one patients uh, here in the United States for whom we have a particular conundrum because we know a lot of those patients are destined to die from their lung cancer, and yet for the majority of those patients, we don't offer any intervention uh, after uh, surgery alone. And you can see, again, a very clear separation of high, intermediate, and low-risk patients. And I might point out that you can see from this graph that the high-risk patients, even in stage one alone in the Kaiser cohort, have a five-year survival of only uh, approximately 50%. Now, one of the caveats that uh, leaders in this field established as an absolute requirement for any reliable uh, molecular prognostic system is that it truly be independent of stage. And I might point out here that it's only gene expression data uh, culled from the analysis of 14 genes, which are 11 uh, active cancer genes and three housekeeping genes. It's only the data about gene expression that drives the uh, derivation of the risk score that separates patients into high intermediate and low risk uh, for five year survival. Um, there are no clinical uh, covariates involved in the derivation of that risk score. And when you look at risk score within individual stages of disease, you see the same type of separation of high, intermediate, and low risk patients based on actual uh, outcome. 
Uh, and so you can see here in the China cohort, stage one, stage two patients are clearly separated uh, individually based on uh, molecular risk score alone. Now, um, it's important to look at uh, uh, multivariate uh, and univariate analysis to understand how this risk score compares to other predictors of outcome. And uh, suffice it to say that um, both univariate and importantly multivariate analysis really confirmed that compared to any of the available clinical pathologic uh, criteria, a high risk designation by molecular uh, prognostic analysis, which a, was a much more meaningful and uh, a much more telling indicator of five-year survival than any of the other uh, clinical pathologic uh, covariates, uh, either alone or when adjusted in a multivariate approach. And I might point out that the one factor that clinicians have tended to rely on the most uh, in terms of deciding whether or not a stage one or a stage one B patient is going to be a candidate for early uh, systemic uh, adjuvant intervention is that size of the tumor. So even among stage one B patients, because of a little bit of data that we have available from the CalGB9633 study, in which a post hoc uh, retrospective analysis uh, of those data allowed identification of a four centimeter cutoff that did identify patients uh, in that study who did uh, see a benefit from uh, systemic adjuvant uh, chemotherapeutic intervention. When you compare the true prognostic uh, reliability of tumor size greater than four centimeters with uh, high risk designation uh, based on the molecular prognostic, uh, you can see that there's really no comparison in terms of the value of the prognostic information uh, with the high risk of molecular categorization being a much more uh, telling uh, uh, hazard ratio of 2.04 compared to um, the much smaller hazard ratio associated uh, with tumor size. Now, we did, of course, a similar uh, uh, Cox uh, uh, proportional hazards uh, modeling with our China cohort, and uh, we see a very similar story that uh, both univariate and multivariate analysis confirm that a high risk designation uh, by this molecular assay is truly indicative of a uh, poor prognosis, even in the the presence and even after adjusting for other uh, clinical covariates. What's interesting about the China cohort is that we now have the ability, uh, now have the ability to adjust for TNM stage itself. And of course, TNM stage should be, must be an accurate predictor of outcome. Otherwise, there's something uh, very wrong in the state of Denmark. Uh, and you can see that even when adjusting for stage itself, there's still a 2.4 uh, hazard ratio associated with a high risk designation that is uh, extremely clinically significant so that we truly are going above and beyond uh, clinical pathologic TNM staging in identifying patients in all stages after resection who are at uh, the highest risk of uh, death within five years of surgery. At this point, I want to um, just bring the discussion back very briefly to a point I made earlier even though the TNM uh, staging system that was introduced in 2009 uh, benefited from a very large cohort of patients, both in terms of derivation of criteria for TNM categorization, as well as validation of the new system, only about 2,000 patients in stage one actually uh, were available for validation of the new TNM system. Well, we have looked at nearly uh, 1,000 stage one patients in our combined uh, Kaiser and China Clinical Trials Consortium uh, independent validation studies. So we're really, uh, an, uh, I should say a thousand patients just in stage one alone. So we're really talking about a scale of validation of this molecular, molecular prognostic that is quite similar to the scale of validation for the TNM system that's used to guide just about every management decision uh, in early stage lung cancer. Let me take a brief step back and just uh, re-emphasize that, that this assay 
is targeted just for patients with a non squamous histology. And uh, let me explain that uh, the reason behind that is that we're, we really decided to let the biology of the tumors, uh, as reflected by uh, their uh, molecular um, gene expression profiling, tell us what were the most important factors uh, in determining uh, outcome. And the biology of squamous cell uh, carcinoma really is a very different beast from the biology of uh, non-squamous disease. And if we tried to lump these very different biological entities together, uh, we knew we would be introducing a lot more noise uh, into the system and that the likelihood of being able to reflect that system back out into the wide community of uh, international patients would be much less likely to succeed. And this was based uh, not only on work with these paraffin samples, but again on preliminary studies that we had done with uh, many hundreds of fresh frozen samples that really confirmed what the literature had already established, which is that there's a fundamental difference in the biology of squamous cell carcinoma and the uh, various non-squamous varieties that we see uh, in, uh, in lung cancer. And so this assay is really uh, derived and applicable just to non-squamous histologies. Now, uh, this is a molecular prognostic test. It's not a diagnostic test. And so uh, there are measurements of uh, statistical accuracy, such as uh, specificity um, and um, positive predictive value that are relevant when evaluating a diagnostic test that is a very definitive type of test that gives you uh, a clear uh, diagnosis, those statistical tools are simply not available when you're dealing with a probabilistic test like this one that gives you a prognosis in terms of risk, but not a diagnosis in terms of a definitive uh, categorization of a patient. So there will be high risk patients who certainly will survive five years and low risk patients who will succumb to their disease. What we're talking about is better identifying the degree of risk so that a better clinical decision can be made uh, for each individual patient. So when you compare different tools for probabilistic or what are also known uh, as stochastic tests, instead of looking at uh, sensitivity and specificity, we have to use other means to gauge uh, probabilistic assignment of patients to risk groups. The OROC or area under the receiving uh, operator curve is a tool that has been very well established in the evaluation of uh, probabilistic or risk uh, assessment tests, certainly in other areas such as uh, the realm of cardiovascular disease where risk assessment has been an important part of uh, patient management uh, for many, many years. And when we used uh, an OROC approach to compare this molecular assay to, for example, the NCCN criteria for identifying high-risk patients in stage one who should be uh, earmarked and uh, recommended and designated for early uh, chemotherapeutic intervention, uh, trust me in, in uh, interpreting these curves for you that there was a dramatic improvement in the accuracy of the information when we considered the molecular prognosis and didn't rely solely on the NCCN criteria to identify high-risk patients. But what does that mean in simple terms? It means that if uh, NCCN is recommending that we identify high-risk stage one patients, because those patients are very likely to harbor undetected metastatic disease and therefore are likely, based on existing literature, to derive benefit from systemic intervention that could address that systemic disease, this molecular test is now very clearly documented to be a better means of identifying those high-risk patients in stage one. Now, when you think about um, the future and the immediate future, hopefully will involve uh, a greater degree of screening for early stage lung cancer and therefore identifying earlier and earlier stage patients uh, for management and for intervention, we realize that there may be a lot of very small tumors coming down the pike 
in lung cancer. And recently, there's actually been some very interesting science and uh, notice of that science in the lay press that we may need to rethink our approach to the earliest stage of patients with a variety of cancers who are identified through aggressive screening programs, because the outcomes for those patients may not be the same as the outcomes for all comers uh, who were identified in the days before aggressive screening. Well, one thing that we know is that screening for lung cancer, particularly with uh, a, a low dose, uh, high resolution uh, CT scanning approach, is very likely to identify a lot more patients with very small tumors, nodules that are eventually proven to be a non-small cell lung cancer. And so when we think not only of stage one, not only of stage 1A, but actually T1A tumors, in other words, tumors that are not only early stage, but actually less than two centimeters in, in maximum diameter, we may uh, want to know how many of those patients are likely to harbor metastatic disease. Because traditional data have told us that even those patients with the smallest tumors, i.e. T1A patients, still are at very high risk with non-small cell lung cancer to harbor undetected metastatic disease. And so, so we undertook a separate analysis that was published uh, last fall in JAMA, just about one year ago, in which we looked specifically only at uh, T1A tumors uh, with N0 uh, designation. So these are the earliest possible uh, stage of patients that, that undergo surgery and come back to the surgeon's office uh, for uh, an assessment uh, at that early post-op visit. So these earliest uh, stage patients, we're, we're, we normally reassure have the best possible prognosis. But by running this molecular assay, we were able to identify a third of patients. So out of about 270 patients, about 90 of those patients were designated as high risk by the molecular assay. And those patients had a 50% mortality when we looked at their outcomes. So even among the lowest risk patients who by almost any conventional standard would be sent off and offered no possible intervention to lower uh, their chances of succumbing to lung cancer within five years, we are now able to identify a very important, very large patient subpopulation uh, who are at very high risk for mortality. And since they're succumbing in general to um, distant metastatic disease, these are patients who are leaving our offices with undetected metastasis, who are very likely to be the ones to derive the most benefit from systemic intervention. And now we have a means available to offer them uh, something different other than just uh, observation and a wish for the best of luck. So uh, to summarize uh, the information and uh, some of the conclusions I've attempted to put in front of you today, I think it's clear that the 30 to 60% mortality uh, for early stage lung cancer, even after attempts at curative resection is really not acceptable, particularly in the face of, of uh, improvements that we've achieved in survival for other solid uh, cancers. Um, I hope I've convinced you that we now have a very robust and very practical assay available. Uh, again, it's known as Prevenio Lung RS, and uh, anyone can go to the web and get more information about ordering this test for their early stage patients. Uh, but importantly, this test has undergone a very rigorous, blinded, independent validation program that um, means that the data are reliable uh, and can be used to help guide uh, clinical decision making uh, in the here and now. Uh, again, um, this new prognostic system is independent of a conventional TNM uh, criteria and other clinical pathologic criteria. And it's actually been documented uh, to do a more reliable job of identifying patients in stage one who are at very high risk of disease. So if conventional staging doesn't uh, get us to where we want to be right now. Uh, and as a result, many of our early stage lung cancer patients are succumbing to distant metastasis. Uh, perhaps uh, it's time to look for a way to access better uh, informed uh, decisions and therefore uh, better uh, management decisions for patients 
who may very well stand to derive a great deal of intervention, a, a great deal of benefit from early intervention for uh, their early metastatic disease. And let me remind you again uh, that the data that are available from uh, prospective randomized studies suggests that we're not only able to slightly prolong survival as we are in late stage lung cancer, but we may actually be able to cure some patients with early metastatic disease if we intervene early and certainly achieve more than just a few months uh, of added uh, survival to their lives. And we've tended to see the greatest benefit among patients who are at the greatest risk, which means that those patients deserve to be identified and, is, and deserve to be offered uh, a greater um, uh, array of uh, therapeutic options. Again, there are standing recommendations out there to use the best possible prognostic information to make better decisions, even for stage one patients for whom we don't yet have prospective randomized data on improving uh, their outlook for survival. But we're facing these difficult decisions right now, and it's rarely been the case in clinical medicine that better information has not led uh, to better decision-making and ultimately better outcomes for our patients. So right now, we're left with a perception of risk among uh, early stage uh, lung cancer patients, but uh, it's, it's truly a perception based on a system that doesn't really distinguish very, very well between patients who've been cured by surgery and those who harbor a very significant, whether it's 30% or 60 to 70% risk of uh, harboring undetected uh, metastatic disease, we can now take that perception of low risk and use a molecular prognostic tool to really tell us who's at low risk, who really uh, should be managed simply with monitoring uh, and watchful waiting, and who are truly at high risk despite uh, clinical pathologic criteria, uh, patients who not only uh, deserve closer monitoring perhaps, but actually early intervention that may modify their risk and really reduce their risk of late stage uh, recurrence down the road. Now, it would be remiss uh, for me not to mention uh, the plethora of really talented uh, 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 and dedicated individuals who contributed to the research that I presented to you today. Uh, my close uh, friend and colleague, Dave Jablons, uh, who uh, uh, worked with me together in managing uh, this uh, research program from its uh, beginnings uh, really all the way through uh, these uh, more recent large-scale validations. I'd also like to mention uh, Johannes Kratz, a very uh, brilliant uh, young uh, thoracic surgeon coming out of the Mass General System who will be joining our faculty uh, at uh, UCSF uh, in the summer, uh, as well as, again, a cadre of other folks both here in the United States and California and uh, across the ocean uh, in the China Clinical uh, Trials Consortium. Now, I've been asked uh, to remind folks that uh, you can sign up for uh, CME and CE credit uh, by accessing the website that's uh, on the screen right now at uh, bioconferencelive.com. And uh, I believe a number of questions uh, have uh, been uh, typed in during the course of the lecture. And uh, I can uh, uh, try to run through some of those questions uh, for you now and uh, give you uh, a little bit more detailed information. So uh, again, I will read uh, some of these questions for you uh, and, uh, and answer them as best I can in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. First question, was RNA uh, from the FFP samples extracted using the same uh, sample prep protocol? And I assume uh, that the question is referring to uh, both the research uh, that we did in developing the assay, as well as the assay as it's run now in the CLIA certified laboratory uh, that's run by Life Technologies uh, out here in California, and by uh, any and all laboratories that may have been involved in the validation studies. Well, first of all, let me reassure you that uh, all of the data that went into uh, the validation studies that were published uh, in The Lancet uh, and later in JAMA were run under uh, CLIA conditions uh, and were uh, CLIA, CLIA valid uh, assays uh, if they were run on patients in the United States and that uh, a essentially CLIA equivalent laboratory was actually established uh, in China uh, in one centralized location 
uh, to run uh, the specimens on the patients there. So it was absolutely the identical assay uh, that was run in the validation studies that can be accessed by patients and clinicians now uh, through uh, a, a very a rigorously certified uh, CLIA program and uh, CLIA laboratory uh, run by Life Technologies. Uh, and to specifically answer this question, absolutely, uh, we have, uh, ever since establishing the assay, used uh, one standard, uh, very rigorous uh, RNA extraction protocol that really takes into consideration some of the unique properties of this lung cancer tissue and the type of RNA that we can derive from formalin-fixed uh, paraffin-embedded specimens. Uh, the next question uh, on the list is, uh, how did the FFPE and fresh frozen samples correlate? Very good question, uh, because the earliest uh, data in our program was derived from uh, fresh frozen tissue, in which we boiled down uh, hundreds of candidate genes uh, to a cadre first of about 200 genes that we studied very intensely that was boiled down to about 60 genes uh, that told a story about early stage lung cancer. And finally, the dozen or so genes that have been incorporated into the actual assay. So it is relevant as, and it is important uh, to understand um, how the data from FFP samples do correlate back to fresh frozen samples in which the RNA is quite frankly of a higher quality. And as is reported uh, uh, in our publication material, I believe if you go um, to the supplement uh, for the Lancet, you'll see uh, some data uh, regarding this question. There was um, very, very close correlation, uh, not only in terms of the, the individual degree of gene expression that we, we were able to achieve through our very rigorously developed FFPE uh, RNA extraction uh, and quantitative PCR system, because those two really go together closely hand in hand. We developed an RT-PCR system that was customized to perform with uh, RNA that's extracted from FFP samples, specifically from lung cancer tumor tissue. Uh, so there was not only a high degree of correlation in gene expression data, but uh, Certainly with the risk scores and the risk categorization that's achieved, there was very tight correlation uh, between what, what we were able to see when we had fresh frozen samples available and those samples uh, in which uh, we also worked with uh, for formalin fixed uh, paraffin embedded tissue. The next question uh, asks about the um, uh, area under the receiver operating curve analysis, I, I believe. And, and the question is uh, how high a number, and it's actually a C statistic, uh, that is the actual uh, statistical entity that one can derive from an, uh, an area under the receiver operating curve uh, analysis. Um, and that C statistic uh, for those uh, who are not so familiar with this uh, area of statistical analysis and research, uh, is really telling you what is the fidelity if you compare two different, uh, in this case, prognostic systems or probabilistic systems. What is the fidelity if you compare on an individual, patient, uh, individual basis, in this case, patient per patient or sample per sample, uh, what is the fidelity if you compare a risk categorization or any categorization for that matter, uh, between two samples, is a higher risk category likely to give you a, uh, a worse outcome uh, when you compare two systems, uh, again, on an individual basis, side by side. And unfortunately, uh, when we looked at the uh, ORAC analysis uh, for the NCCN criteria, which is all we have now for identifying high-risk stage one patients who deserve a better shot at survival. The, uh, the C statistic uh, using TNM plus uh, clinical pathologic criteria wasn't much better uh, than 0.5, uh, which suggests that you're dealing with uh, something close to the toss of a coin in terms of relying on those criteria to decide whether a patient is truly high risk or not. And uh, the uh, prognostic system, uh, the, I, I should say the prognostic information available from the molecular uh, test was, uh, I believe, closer to uh, 
which tells you that at least you're moving away from the toss of a coin and you're really getting a, uh, an answer that's much more uh, meaningful uh, to the clinician in terms of guiding a treatment decision. Uh, and the p-value associated with the comparison of those statistics was extremely small, uh, less than 0 0.001. Uh, I might also point out, again, for those who are familiar, uh, or I should say unfamiliar with this system, that the um, C statistic itself uh, doesn't uh, give you any kind of quantitative uh, assessment for uh, the, the improvement of uh, one system uh, over another. And a, a classic example is that uh, an, improve, uh, an increase in C statistic uh, on the order of 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 is all that we've seen by incorporating very meaningful prognostic elements into analyses uh, in cardiovascular disease, such as uh, HDL and LDL uh, cholesterol levels. Um, and I think a related question, uh, and, and again, I, I thank the audience for these questions because it does help me once again to address uh, this important issue. Um, this question asks, um, what was the positive predictive and negative predictive value? So again, uh, let me um, emphasize that when you're dealing with a probabilistic test of any sort, um, it's impossible to derive uh, a positive and negative predictive value because it's not a deterministic test. So there is no way uh, to derive a specificity or a uh, sensitivity because you're not giving a definitive a diagnosis or definitive designation to the patient. You're assigning them to a risk category and you're letting the patient know that you're at a relatively high or relatively low risk of a particular outcome. So it's virtually impossible uh, to derive and, and therefore impossible to think about uh, positive predictive values or negative predictive values or sensitivities or specificities when you're dealing with a probabilistic system. But that is all we could possibly do. And that's what the TNM uh, approach itself is. It's nothing more than a probabilistic system. It's a uh, prognostic approach based on retrospective analysis of patient outcomes. That is TNM staging. And unfortunately, the probabilistic information that we get from TNM staging in early stage lung cancer just isn't crisp and um, discriminatory enough for us to really know which of those patients are truly high or low risk uh, for harboring metastatic disease. And so what we know from the ORAC analysis is that since you do need to rely on some type of probabilistic assessment for patient risk in order to decide whether or not the individual patient is a good candidate for chemotherapy or not, you want to have the best possible, most reliable possible information regarding risk level and uh, potential outcome. And that's where this assay outshines uh, the traditional TNM approach alone, even combined with other clinical pathologic criteria. Uh, and that's where the ORAC analysis is really very meaningful and very helpful because it tells you very definitively that if you rely on the molecular prognostic rather than just clinical pathologic criteria alone, you're going to get a much more accurate designation of each patient in terms of high or low risk for recurrence. So there's no way to think about positive or negative predictive values uh, because there's no way to diagnose these patients with undetectable metastasis or not. But we're dealing with a different set of tools, ones that guide us toward the best possible uh, clinical decision given the, the information and the tools we have available. So I hope all of that information has been helpful. Uh, again, I'll uh, uh, refer you back to the website that um, uh, you can use to uh, sign up for uh, CE and CME credit. And I thank you very much uh, for your participation in this seminar. And uh, I uh, look forward to addressing uh, other questions that folks might have uh, through uh, email uh, and, and other means that we have possible. Again, thank you very, very much.